investors are always on the hunt for new ways to grow their portfolios. And there's a useful tool that many may not have considered, options trading. Yes, it's often used by active traders to focus on short-term profits, but in this episode, we'll hear how one long-term investor uses options to help get her closer to her financial goals. You're watching Inside Investing. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Inside Investing, the show that helps you level up your financial knowledge and sharpen your investing skills. I'm your host, Caitlin Cormier. Joining us is Tracy Ma, founder of Financial Nirvana Mama. Tracy, it's always wonderful to have you on our program. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you for having me. It's always so fun to do this. So you're a long-term investor at heart. So what got you interested in trading options? When you've been investing for so long, um, and then you, you're one of your heroes or mentors is like the, one of the greatest investors in the world being Warren Buffett. And you learn about his investing strategies, which includes options. Then it just makes natural sense that I'm going to learn about it. And then I realize how he's been making extra income and my stocks on sale. So I just try to do what Warren Buffett does. All right. He see, it seems to have worked out pretty well for him. So I can understand why you might uh, <laughs> take some tips from him. Options trading might be a little bit intimidating for beginners. You said you've kind of been doing it for a while. So how did you kind of build your knowledge and skill without risking a lot of money? Well, I would read a lot of books. So it's not like I just jumped in. Um, I would read a lot of books, learning about the terminology, because there's a huge hurdle just with lingo. If you could get over the financial lingo and just understand the basics, then um, do a practice account, meaning like open an account where you trade with fake money, then you can learn the mechanics and machinery of it. But once you understand it, then it's actually not that hard to understand. It's like a very simple strategy. But I think the biggest thing, the biggest um, hurdle for people and obstacle is the financial jargon. So true. We get caught up in it all the time. So hopefully we'll break it down for our audience today. All right. Before we get into our conversation, just a quick note to our viewers. We'll be chatting through some option strategies that Tracy uses that suit her goals as a long-term investor. That said, each investor's situation is unique and they may not make sense for you. So take them as food for thought in our conversation rather than financial advice that's broadly applicable to everyone. With that said, let's get into it. So first off, let's great lay some groundwork for those who may not be familiar with options trading. So what is an option contract and how does it work at a high level? Yes, an option is literally just a contract. Just think of it as option as a contract between a buyer and seller. And then it obligates one of the parties to buy or sell the um, underlying stock at a set price, which is whatever is effectively in the contract is a bunch of 100 shares of a stock. And then there's obviously in the contract, there's a timestamp in it. And in the exchange, um, you could get some premium or you could owe some premium, which is money. A call option gives the buyer the right to purchase shares at a set price before the contract expires in exchange for a premium that you have to pay to the call seller. So the seller who's selling a call option would receive the premium, which is money. And but they're obligated to sell their shares to the call buyer if they're signed on the contract. Now, options contracts are a way to generate income in the form of premiums, which is money. And then you need to predict on the future price of a stock. So let's use an example to explain very simply what a call option is called up. So everyone likely has known someone or has owned and bought a home, like owned or, or sold a home. So let's use um, putting your house on the market. So say you put a house on the market, think of that as a contract. You put a contract for your house to on the MLS market and say your house is only worth like $800,000. But you're like, oh, I would love it to, um, you know, put the house on the market and get it potentially sold for a million. Now, putting this contract out in the market in MLS, you all, all of a sudden get some premium for putting this contract out. And then um, you're deciding, okay, I'm going to put out for like 90 days. 
that nine days is the um, expiration. That's when the contract expires. So that's basically you effectively put a contract out in the market on MLS for a million dollars to sell your home, even though it's only worth $800,000. And you collected some premium for putting this contract out. And um, you're only obligated to have this contract out for 90 days. That's the expiration date. Now, best case scenario, um, you you put the house in the market and then uh, it, it doesn't sell because <laughs> no one wants to buy it a million. Well, you've collected some premium just for putting your house in the market and you still get to keep your house. Worst case scenario is that you put the house in the market and then the buyer, because you're, um, you're selling a call option, the buyer decides to come back to you and say, hey, I want to buy your house for a million dollars. So you effectively given up your home for a million dollars and you still collected some premium. So you got to move out of your house. <laughs> All right. I think that that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, there are a lot of terms that we kind of went through that some might be unfamiliar with. So what are some of the key aspects that investors need to understand? So I'm going to go through some basic options terminology is probably going to be a little bit overwhelming, but just bear with me. And then I'll give an example at the very end. So uh, a strike price, um, there are three funny terms <laughs> with with the strike price. Strike price is that the, the price that the contract, being the options contract, is triggered. Um, there's one called at the money. That's when it's at the near or close to the current stock price. So at the money. In the money um, is like when the stock is below the current stock market price in the case of calls and then uh out of the money is when the strike price is above the current stock price in the case of calls and then there's um expiration date which is the time frame when the contract expires the premium is the amount of money that you the counterparty the other party in the contract is willing to to um, exchange for the obligation to fulfill the agreement. So basically it's just the money that's um, put on the contract is called premiums. Then there's exercise and that's when exercise means the option holder wants the counterparty, the other party to fulfill the contract. It's, it's, it's the date that's expiring. And then there's assignments and that's when the other parties informed that they must fulfill the contract. So using the real estate example where you put your house in the market for a million dollars, um, if you put in a contract out for, say, 60 days, that's the expiration date. So that could be like if you if it's, um, you know, right now it's like June and you put a contract out for August, whatever the date in August, that's the expiration date. The money that you collected for putting that contract out, your house on the market on MLS, and you collected some premiums, like say, I don't know, like $5,000 for putting that contract out, that is called premiums, which is the amount of money you're collecting. The exercise is when, when the actual date happens and then it's someone actually decides to want to buy your house for a million dollars, they can exercise the contract. So in the moment they say, hey, I'm willing to buy your house a million, they've exercised the contract. And then when it actually happens, it's called assignment. So that's when the other parties are formed that you've actually been informed that your contract's been fulfilled, your house is sold in the market for millions. So then the other party has been assigned that house. Anyways, I hope that helps with the terminology. Um, once you understand just the nuances of that, I would say fundamentally the strike price, expiration date, premium, exercise assignment, and um, that makes it so much easier to just do options. So options are often thought of as an instrument a short-term trader might use. So how can they be useful to long-term investors like you? The way I like to do it is I like to first um, generate income from it and or buy stocks on sale. So in terms of generating income, I like to sell options, which is selling a contract where I collect premium for putting this contract out. And um, so for example, I to sell, if I own like a hundred shares, remember each con each options contract is um, one contract is equivalent to a hundred shares. So if I own a hundred shares of a stock, I could sell covered calls on them 
to juice juiced returns because I want to get extra income that I can subsidize and it would actually discount the average basis price on my stocks. And then the other op, um, way I like to do is I like to buy options, which is to gain exposure to stock without having come up with the whole, you know, um, amount of money for a hundred shares. So this is where you have to be very, very bullish, meaning you have to be very um, confident that this is a high quality company and that it will, um, you know, return, give you a good return on investment in the future, meaning it's going to go up in price. So for example, I like to buy a call on a stock that I believe will rise in, the pr in price in like two years time. So I can lock in a price now at a much cheaper price, like at 50%, like it's like a down payment for a hundred shares that I um, could exercise in the future, meaning I uh, can exercise this options like in a year or two time. So I like to buy a call. Um, they're called, they're much longer contracts. I don't trade options as a long-term investor. I really use it to try to own um, stocks at a much cheaper price or to, to collect income um, for these stocks I own, or I like to own more. So we're going to break this down a little bit more. Um, so let's kind of get into the basics of the strategies you you use. But first, set the stage for us. So how much money do you think an investor would need in order to trade options? Well, I would say it's, it's not just the money, but um, if it was just strictly financial, first, you need to absolutely have enough money to buy, if you were to buy a call option, of 100 shares of the underlying company. So the stock that you like to trade options. So, um, so one options contract is equivalent to a hundred shares. So whatever that stock is, you need to be able to buy a hundred shares in the future. If you were to buy call options. All right. And what kind of market dynamics do you generally look for that can kind of tell you that it might make sense to trade options on a particular stock? So my favorite time is bear market when the market is going down. So I like to trade options during this time because there's so many high quality companies that are on sale. So then I like to, I guess, make use of the funds I have available. So for example, I could be buying a call option for two reasons. Um, I'm expecting that these stocks that I have a trade, like I have a watch list of companies I own and I just want to own more of. And so I'm looking at it like, okay, there it's a bear market right now. The price has gone down. I'm able to acquire more of these shares of this one company that I'm really interested in. And I, it's a high quality company. And in my humble opinion, I know it's um, undervalued and then it will rebound in the future. So I'm looking to acquire shares at a much cheaper price and then reap a larger return when my call option pans out like in one to two years time. And at that time in the bear market, it also tends to be higher volatility, meaning it's just a lot of fear that there's a huge fluctuation in prices. And when the volatility is higher in the market, the um, premiums, um, if I were to sell an option, I would, could receive a lot higher than, um, than typically that's, that's like where, where the market, the stock market is really boring, meaning when no one's scared in the stock market. So when the fear index, so anyone can Google this, like a fear index, and you could see like when it's very fearful, that's when the volatility is a lot higher. And then if you're selling options, you could be collecting a lot higher premiums and that's really adding to the income. Um, so in fact, this accelerates the growth of my portfolio because I'm collecting more income. And then use that to buy call options against shares that I'm like really wanting to buy and really bullish on in one to two years time. Any other times? Mm, well, when a company experiences temporary bad news, such as it could be a bad tweet. <laughs> it could be um, a, like a unfavorable lawsuit, but, you know, it's going to, you know, it's just more like just just a lot of news, clickbait news that's going to get people scared and then people sell. And this depends. And if people sell that deep, that like drops the stock price. Although there's a psychology part that I'm playing with the stock market and I love it when everyone's fearful temporarily depresses the stock price. 
And then I could trade options with some confidence that this stock price, which I believe is undervalued, will eventually rebound once these bad news just, you know, over time just goes away. So generally, I try to reduce um, as many moving parts as possible when trading options so that there's like less unpredictability around the outcomes of my trade. So the things I really avoid. And so when I talk about I love temporary bad news, but then just just a big caveat, I don't trade. I don't do it during earnings because that that fundamental thing about earnings, you never know. It could be the best earnings, meaning like the company is going to be like announcing great news about the revenue. Everything looks positive, but because they didn't do something like give forward guidance or the forward guidance is not what was expected, it can, the stock price can drop. It's very unpredictable. So I would always avoid um, trading around earnings and also more more recently would be the bank bank of canada interest rate announcements because that's also made it super unpredictable because um we're in a high interest rate environment and um people are always like really on it if it was like maybe seven years ago and everyone knew that they weren't going to do anything with the interest rate then i wouldn't be so um wary of it but definitely now i'm super wary of it all right. Before we continue, I have a quick question for our viewers. Are you enjoying the show so far? Then make sure to subscribe to TD's Direct Investing YouTube channel. And if there's a topic you'd like to learn more about, let us know in the comments. Okay, Tracy, let's dig into the option strategies you like to use as a long-term investor. So the first one is selling covered calls. How does this strategy work and how might it supercharge your portfolio growth? Okay, just basics. Selling covered calls is like covered meanings I have the shares. So um, I am always make sure that when I'm selling covered calls, I have 100 shares of this underlying company. So one option contract equals 100 shares. And then what I do is I sell a call option. So I give another party the right to purchase my shares at a certain strike price and before the expiration date of the contract. So Obviously, I'm not just going to give up my 100 shares. I'm looking to receive a decent amount of premium, which is money, in exchange for the buyer to buy my contract. And um, I do this because I like to you know, gain extra income. So worst case scenario is that it could, someone might buy my contract and then, um, or, and they, you know, the stock price does rise to the price that um, I put it at, like the strike price. And then at that time, then the buyer would get assigned the shares, the 100 shares. And I would, worst case scenario, let go <laughs> of my 100 shares in this contract. So that's worst case scenario. I, you know, I'm still collecting income and then I'm going to get paid out the profits of, you know, selling these shares, but I have to, you know, worst case scenario, I'm going to give up my hundred shares. And then the best case scenario is that they are not assigned. So I get to keep my shares and I've collected income along the way. So you can imagine that you have to be, you know, pretty like you have to work on the psychology side and say, do you think it's going to hit? Like if you're willing to sell your shares at a certain price, do you think it's going to really hit that strike price in like 30 days or 60 days? So that's what selling cover call. And um, each time I sell a cover call, I receive a form of income, which is called premiums. And then I could treat it like when with the income that I'm collecting, I could treat it like it's subsidizing the stock price, the, the price of the uh, shares that I bought in the first place. So for example, if I bought the stock at $50 per share, but I'm collecting a dollar premium for each cover call I sell, then my effective purchase price would be $49 per share minus any um, transaction fees. And then you can imagine if you rinse and repeated this and you never um, actually sold your shares in with this selling the cover call because it never got exercised you could be doing this rinse and repeat for months and months and be subsidizing your stocks and getting at a cheaper price love it gotta love it when you're taking the cost down right that's always a good thing so i have a feeling that when we talk about making profit it has a little bit to do with that strike price that you're talking about so how do you 
choose an appropriate strike price when selling covered calls that suits your needs as a long-term investor? So there are two ways I'm doing it. One is I choose a strike price that I'm confident it won't be reached at before the expiration date. And how do I, how do I figure that out? The, what, the, what, there's one way where you could just, um, and I use both ways. So the first way is fundamentals. So you, everyone hopefully is very clear or un, um, understand what the price per earnings ratio is a very easy peasy metric to tell you if it's overpriced or underpriced. So if I look at the PE ratio and I look at it like, okay, if I choose a strike price in the future, that would be a really high PE price. Um, if I were to reverse engineer what the PE ratio is, then I would be, you know, like I would say it's unlikely it's going to hit that, but you never know. Then I, um, so at that point, worst case scenario, I always think if it does hit that price, the strike price, I'm willing to lose the share. So that's the worst case, but um, I'm just more likely than not, I'm just hoping that it doesn't get to that price. Um, and even if it does, I guess, it's like I'm willing to let go because it's like overpriced in my mind at that point. And then I also look at technicals. So this is the, you know, looking at like these, the stock charts and I'm looking at the 100 day moving average. So I'm looking at like, is it within the range of those 100 days? And if it's not, then and it's like like. I'm choosing a price that's way out of the range, then this is giving me some idea. Like, is it likely to move um, outside of this range in the next, you know, 30 to 60 days? And that's why I'm saying it, because typically stocks move within a range um, and it's a reversion back to down to the 100 day moving average. And then um, I also look at the volatility of the broader market. So I use the a volatility index, which is the VIX, to gauge this. So if the market volatility is high, that means there's just a lot more uncertainty. Usually there's fear, there's something that's going on that's making the, the, the market like uncertain. And that's when premiums tend to be higher. So this is like, I'm trying to basically not <laughs> lose my shares. <laughs> so I make sure I choose a strike price that I think would be overpriced. I choose um, a price that's way, way above the 100 day moving average. And then I choose a price, that price in a time when the stock market is pretty scary. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So then you get a lot of premiums um, during this time. So it makes it worth it to do it. And the worst case scenario is I give up my 100 shares, but then I could, I mean, I guess I could buy it back afterwards if I really want to. Right. Okay. Love it. Let's talk about those expiry dates. So we're strike price is important, but also that time frame is important. So what's the sweet spot for you when you're selling a cover call? I'm very uncomfortable selling like longer expiration dates. So I like to pick something within typically 30 to 60 days max. It's within the 100 day moving average within the technical range. So this offers decent premiums as one. And I'm more confident with projecting a stock market's price movement. Um, when it's further out, it's like, then there's just more things that could happen. What if a war happens? What if, you know, um, a big announcement happens, a big merger and acquisition? It's way harder to predict that, like in six months to 12 months to a year and a half. So that's why I like to choose 30 to 60 days. Um, I find also the the risk and reward trade-off more worthwhile. Otherwise, in other words, there's just too little chance of the stock market moving sharply enough for me to collect a decent premium. So like, I'd like to take advantage of when the market's fearful. I can't time that like in two years, two years time when the market's going to be scary. <laughs> I just know, okay, right now something happened. And that's why I like to uh, predict within 30 to 60 days out. Thank you for walking us through your best practices for selling covered calls. Now let's hop into WebBroker to show our viewers how it's done. All right, we are going to go through the process of both purchasing a security and writing a call at the same time today. I'm going to click on strategies here within my order ticket and I'm going to choose multi-leg. So we're doing a transaction where we have two transactions happening at the same time. The first leg here is going to be where we purchase the stock. So I'm going to choose the stock and just go ahead and type in whichever stock I'm looking to purchase. 
I'm looking to buy. And in this case, let's just say we're gonna purchase 100 shares. Next, we're gonna come down to the second piece here where we're going to write the call. And I'm gonna click option chain to find out what my premium might look like. I need to make sure I choose an expiry date. And then I'm gonna look through the strikes and choose which strike price I would like for my call. And I'm gonna hover over the bid price in order to write that call. You'll notice I have my expiry, my strike price, it's a call, and I'm gonna to sell to open covered, which just simply means I'm selling the option and it's covered, meaning that I have the stock, I'm buying the stock at the same time. I'm gonna choose one as my quantity, so that will be 100 shares are represented by one option contract. You'll notice as well that the price of the stock minus the premium you're receiving will result in your net debit here. So our purchase price for the stock is effectively going to be lower than the current price for the stock because we're going to take the premium that we're receiving in order to write the call off of the purchase price. When I click on price here, I am gonna choose net debit because it is still gonna be a negative to me. I'm still gonna to have to pay to complete this transaction. And I can go ahead and choose whatever I would like for the limit price. In this case, we have an idea between the mid and natural prices. So I'm just gonna go ahead and choose one right in the middle, choose my length of time I'd like my order open for and go ahead and click preview order. All right, Tracy, let's move on to the second option trade you like to use, which is buying deep in the money call options on stocks you're very bullish on. So we've got a couple lingo things there in the money and bullish. So how does this strategy work and how might it supercharge your portfolio growth? Deep that in the money call options that you're bullish, meaning you're expecting the stock price to go up. So um, I like to think of it as when the stock market is scary and fearful, again, I like to take advantage of that. Um, stock prices are depressed. High quality companies are depressed. And I like to think, well, how can I own 100 shares of this company at, um, at a price I'm willing to put, like, obviously I'm willing to buy it at, but I don't really want to come up with all the money. So in this scenario, I like to buy deep in the money. Like I'm going to owe some money. So I'm going to put in um, a down payment. And the way I look at it is I like to buy, I like to put in a down payment 50% of 100 shares rather than the full 100, you know, having the full amount of money for 100 shares, I'm going to put 50% down payment. And then with the right, with the option to exercise the contract and buy the shares at the strike price in the future. So um, if I don't exercise the option, it can expire worthless, meaning like I don't have to buy it in the future. If I, as long as I, I can always, uh, you know, sell the contract before the expiration date. So I just want to just stress that the way I do this in the money on a stock is that I have to be super, super confident about this company. It's high quality. I know it's going to recover. It's got a huge track record of doing well in the past. And so I like to just buy a call option with a strike price that's already like in the money and has an expiration date of more than a year away or two. Because I find that when it comes to recovering, like a company that's depressed in stock price because maybe the stock market is like very, very scary, it takes about a year or two um, to recover. Because just looking at typical, how long does a bear market last? You know, I think it's around one to two years out. So the more time I out, I'm giving myself more of time frame for the company to recover. So these are called long, uh, they're called leaps, which is long-term equity anticipation securities, which is a mouthful. All I understand, I think what's cool about it is called a leap. So it's a leap in the future. And the idea is to give me the flexibility to buy the stock at like at a price today. So assume I'm buying in the money call option today when the when the stock market is super scary and all the prices have gone down, depressed, and I'm buying the option to buy one to two years out when the I'm hoping that the stock price is going to be a lot more expensive. Now, if I'm wrong about this, I mean I could always just sell the let let the call option um, expire. I mean I I I could let the 
call option expire and it'd be worthless, but that would be like a loss of the money that I owe. Um, the best base case is that I could also sell the call option and still make, you know, hopefully recover some of the money um, or make more money. Um, cause I decide to change my mind. I don't want to, you know, have the option to buy a whole hundred shares in the future. And if I'm right, which is the best case scenario, I get to buy the shares at a huge discount, um, instead of having to buy it right now in the future. So I buy a huge discount two years out and that's what I like to do. So I just like to give myself more time and I don't want to come up with all the money to buy a full hundred shares. So that's why I buy these call options are one to two years up. Uh, okay, of course, investors can never truly be sure which way a stock's price will move. So how do you decide which ones might be a good fit for buying deep in the money calls? It's actually more intuitive than you think. Um, high quality companies, I'm sure if you think of it, they're typically blue chip companies. They've been around for 10 or more years with actual performance in their financial statements. So they have financial results to show. They have a track record of doing well. And in times of bad, which is important, meaning they've been able to withstand and thrive and survive during bad times, which gives me an indication of the resilience of the company. I would say like what's more, what's easier to understand is like you would know when a company has just started, like, I would avoid speculative companies that are um, are just announced on the stock market, which are called initial public offerings, or they been they could have been announced actually years ago, but they actually remain unprofitable. And usually, those are small caps, unprofitable small caps. And then there are things fancy terms like special acquisition corporations, which are SPACs, which again is new. Those companies are all new. It's just a different way of spinning, spinning the company. But my point is that these companies haven't been around for very long and, or they haven't been profitable in all those years. So that in my mind is like a no go. Like I would not buy, that's what I would call not a high quality company, at least in terms of revenue. And then that case, then I don't want to, you know, buy deep in the money calls against these types of companies. I'm not saying that they're all bad. I'm just saying that I just have less, you know, I have less confidence in, in them because they don't have a track record of surviving and thriving during bad times in the market. So as I do uh, with selling cover calls, I like to consider fundamentals and technicals. And my rule of thumb is I typically aim for a strike price. So the price I'm willing to buy it at and, and, and purchase the options, but 50% of the stock's current price. So for example, using an example of say the let's actually, let's use very simple example. If I know that the um, stock price is a hundred dollars today, I would want to only come up 50% of the down payment now with the option to buy the full hundred shares in the future. So in this case, I only want to come up with $50 um, per share, which is in the money. I owe money. So <laughs> I only have enough for 50% of the down payment for a hundred shares. And that's that way my maximum loss um, is 50% of the purchase price, which I'm comfortable assuming if I'm wrong. I just look at the options chain and I look deep in the money, which is going all the way to the top. I mean, depending on how the option chain looks like. And I just try to figure out, okay, is there something where the premium is about 50% I have to come up with? And then with the with the combination equals 100% of the price. So that way I think of it as 50% down payment for 100 shares. Now, options trades don't always play out in an investor's favor. So Tracy, what do you do when one of your trades moves against you to help manage your downside? Well, before I go into any contract, I always look at the absolute worst case scenario. In the case of buying options, the worst case scenario, if you're buying deep in the money call option, is that it could expire worthless. And at that point, you are um, giving up your down payment. But I would say highly unlikely you're giving up entirely all your down payments, which is the premiums you paid up front, which is called in the money, um, because usually the company has value. Now, it's the same as just buying and selling stocks in the stock price in the stock market. You're, you're going to, you know, sometimes um, have to think of the worst case scenario. 
So whenever I enter a trade, I got to accept that the worst outcome could happen. And um, that way it doesn't like, like I don't get scared about it because I already thought about the scenarios, the worst case scenario scenario. And if I accepted it, then that's, then I've already like, like peace of mind, I'm like who super peace. That said, um, sometimes there's a time where I'm like, oh, I'll just, I want to, I want to give it more time to play out. So then I'll push the expiration date of my trade, which is I have to close the contract and then open up another one. And when you do that, they're called, it's called rolling the contract. And this just is just giving you more time to be correct with your trade thesis. Because the tricky thing about options contract is that you have to choose a date. And sometimes that date is like, uh, doesn't pan out. So then you can roll the contract. So for example, if I sell the cover call at $50, a strike price, but no, then notice the stock is just moving super quickly, more quickly than anticipated. And I really, really don't want to sell my shares. Then I could buy a $50 call to cancel the contract that I just sold. And then I would sell another cover call at a slightly higher price, like $6 with an expiration date of another 30 days. So I'm just buying myself more time. And then at least the downsides, I'm just rolling contract that I would reduce the premium I collected. So, or just break even just to, just to extend that time. A lot kind of involved, but at the same time, even if the worst case scenario happens, you're already there. Like, I think that's a really good point as investors, period. We need to sort of understand what worst case is. Uh, in all of our scenarios so that when we go in, if it happens, we're a little bit, you know, prepared for it. Hopefully we've done our research and we've been right. But at the same time, it's, yeah, it's so important to know what worst case scenario is whenever you go into any sort of trade. And just a quick note to our viewers, check out the rest of our Options Education Month content to continue learning about options trading. Visit td.com slash OEM for a full list of educational events. Plus, you can check out the Learning Center on Web Broker and TD's YouTube page for past episodes on options trading and strategies and considerations. All right, Tracy, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you for sharing your approach to trading options as a long-term investor. Any final thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers? Yes, don't don't treat like um, options is actually not that scary. Once you understand that financial jargon, I would say that if you are 100% really interested in it, read some boring books, unfortunately are boring, uh, learn about the te terminology, but most importantly, practice the machinery, practice the mechanics of it in a practice account, typically bare minimum two to three months, ideally six months until you get comfortable with it. All right. I love it. Practice makes perfect or at least makes you more confident <laughs> thanks for joining us and for those in our audience make sure to register for our upcoming live webinars and check out our library of on-demand content available in the learning center and on our youtube page see you all next time Have more questions? Check out the links to the right and in the description below.